The proposed rules before you today will support implementation of an act to protect children's health and the environment from toxic chemicals in toys and children's products. I was honored to serve on the governor's task force to promote safer chemicals and consumer products, which issued its final report in December of 2007. And it was that report that led to enactment of the legislation that you're proceeding under today. I also participated in all four of the day long meetings of the stakeholder process. Um, I also served on the stakeholder process that advised DEP earlier this year on the best approaches to uh, implementing this law and development of, of the rules. The goal of the law as set forth in the statute is to reduce exposure of children and other vulnerable populations to chemicals of high concern by substituting safer alternatives. I have no idea what is in the toilet I play with or what it is made up of. I trust my parents to make good choices of what toys I use. I assume my parents and the government make sure that the toys are safe to play with before they are given to me. Why is it that the states of Maine and Washington and California and Massachusetts are moving forward in a coordinated way to address this problem? Where is the federal government? Why have they not protected us? And that um, is, a, is the problem with the statute that was passed more than 30 years ago called the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is a general statute intended to ensure the safety of chemicals generally appearing in commerce. Describes the Tosca statute as, quote, perhaps the most complex, confusing, and ineffective of all of our federal environmental protection statutes. Now that was written 15 years ago, and nothing has changed. The statute has not been amended in 30 years. Um, substantial new evidence. The statute still puts the burden on the EPA if it wants to regulate a statute, or if it wants to even get information about a statute's risk, to produce substantial evidence that there is a risk. So it's a pure catch-22 problem. It's putting the cart before the horse, and it's placing the burden on, on the EPA to prove its case before it has the information necessary to prove its case. Goal, the think, law confers upon the department the regulatory power to compel disclosure of information on priority chemicals and to prohibit the sale of children's products containing those chemicals when safer alternatives are available. I appreciate this opportunity to present our perspective and, and opposition on these rules. Uh, we represent over 500 members that make toys and distribute toys here in America. Uh, companies do make toys here in Maine, and we want to ensure that this process is one that allows companies to continue to sell their products safely here in Maine. For your competitor to know your sales information and the actual level of a chemical in a product, we believe is a trade secret. Here's how the regulatory scheme works in five steps. Step one is the identification of chemicals of high concern. Under the law and the rule, the department may regulate the use of a chemical in children's product only if the chemical appears on a list of chemicals of high concern. The department and the Maine Center for Disease Control have placed about 1,700 of the estimated universe of 80,000 known chemicals on the initial chemical of high concern list. A chemical may be included on that list only if it has been identified by an authoritative governmental entity on the basis of credible scientific evidence as a carcinogen, a reproductive or developmental toxicant, or an endocrine disruptor, or as persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic, or as very persistent and very bioaccumulative. A chemical must be on the list of chemicals of, of high concern in order for it to be designated as a priority chemical. Uh, there are a few examples. There are others. Uh, the conclusion is clear. I think the current list is in serious need um, of, of, of uh, revision. Opponents ask you to perhaps adopt an imported standard instead of what's in the law, such as the Green Chemistry Initiative. No. It's in the statute. <laughs> we already set that criteria in statute. What we have in this state is a Department of Environmental Protection, which does the legwork, the staff work, and then you do the scientific scrutiny in the Board of uh, Environmental Protection. And then it gets to the legislature as major substantive rules. And we do the policy analysis. We've d done that division of labor. So we finally come to this process where the rules are in front of you now to do the scientific scrutiny. When those chemicals are identified and it gets kicked upstairs for major substantive review, we'll do the policy analysis and we'll have all the same people in the room giving us all the same complaints in a public ongoing process. 
Now, let's get down to the nitty gritty of this. There are about 80,000 chemicals in use, commercial use. 1,700 uh, perhaps on a list of high concern. By 2011, the department's supposed to give us a list of two. This isn't just low-hanging fruit. This is fruit that has fallen to the ground that is already turning to applesauce. The designation of a priority chemical facilitates the gathering of information on the extent to which children may be exposed to the chemical. Um, the act of designation triggers a statutory obligation on the part of manufacturers and distributors to disclose the information on the chemical use in children's products. We do at times have, you know, chemicals and issues du jour, and that's not to say that anyone is, you know, is at fault for doing that, but we do know that we, you know, with 1,700 chemicals that we're starting with, we know that we're going to focus on those that are, that are the most pilloried in the newspapers and so forth, and I'm not sure that that's really the scientific process that we want to, that we really want to use. Um, we've had a tremendous resource here in Maine, Dr. Deborah Rice from the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, who is a toxicologist with the state, uh, vetted that list. We needed something on the legislative end that would do triage, to tell us how should we prioritize this. So we put into statute a framework for doing that. That is now converted into rules, and that's what you're reviewing right now. We were quite specific on where the bar was set and what the criteria were for identification. That was spelled out for you by Mr. James right at the beginning. It's in the statute. We also said don't reinvent the wheel to the Department of Environmental Protection. We said don't go out and do your own research. You haven't got the money. Go out and look at lists that are already done and, and use those lists to help prioritize, to at least screen down to a certain set of chemicals that we can then look at more effectively. Furthermore, do it within existing resources. We can't give you any more money. And this is not a one-size-fit-all legislation or a one-size-fit-all regulation. In a very detailed and individually tailored process to look at particular problems caused by particular chemicals and, um, and their presence in certain products and to tailor both information to gather information first so we know exactly what the risks are and then based on that information to promulgate reasonable regulations to restrict exposure where that's warranted for children's health. Step two of the process is the identification of priority chemicals. The presence of a chemical on the list of chemicals of high concern does not by itself have regulatory consequences. In order to bring our regulatory authorities to bear the department must formally designate the chemical as a priority chemical. Section 2D of the rule would require the department through the board to designate priority chemicals by adoption of a routine technical rule in accordance with the Maine Administrative Procedures Act. Opponents are worried that this is going to be a difficult process that leads to arbitrary and capricious decisions. Let me tell you what arbitrary and capricious really is. It's the way we've been doing it. What's in front of you right now is a better system for doing this, so you can do the triage for us. Step three of the process calls for the collection and review of data on the use of priority chemicals in children's products. Trade secret. This is just a definition of a trade secret and what should be protected from general disclosure. Trade secret means a secret, commercially valuable plan, formula, process, or device that is used for the making, preparing, compounding, or processing of trade commodities and that can be said to be the end product of either innovation or substantial effort. Step four is the collection and review of, of data on the availability of safer alternatives. Step five, the last step of the regulatory scheme, is the substitution of safer uh, alternatives. The, the board may adopt a rule prohibiting the sale of a children's product that contains a priority chemical. Um, so the range just for these four conditions, these four disease categories, the range was $380 million to $650 million a year uh, in Maine alone. Um, I think the results clearly show that inaction is expensive um, and that any money we could put into this process would be well spent. And I finally wanted to mention that many of the conditions I looked at, and this is available in the full report, um, the Maine care, the children in Maine care, um, share disproportionately uh, in those conditions. So many of the estimates and the numbers that I've cited are already paid uh, by the state. If a chemical is linked to cancer, brain problems, reproductive problems, hormone disruption, malformed testicles, I don't want it in my house. I want to know it's in the product. I want to know about safer alternatives. And frankly, as a concerned parent, I want to know that the company is responsible for making these products 
are picking up some of the tab. It's only fair. I've used this example before. I'm sure you have heard it as well. But you take aspirin. Aspirin, once a day, is pretty good. If you take 100 aspirin, you're going to end up in the hospital. Dose makes the poison. I'm sure you've heard that many times before. Rules prohibiting the sale of children's products are designated major substantive under the statute, meaning that it would have to be approved by the legislature for the sales ban to take effect. <clears throat> the rules before us today further the goal of the law by setting forth the process by which we'll identify priority chemicals and detailing exactly how we'll go about collecting information on those chemicals and their use in children's products. <clears throat> 